Okay, I think uh, we have got a critical mass. It's probably a good time to start. And thank you everyone for joining us today. And we're very glad to have Colleen Dalton from Brown University as our speaker today. Colleen got her uh, bachelor degree from Brown University and her PhD from Harvard University. She, she then did a postdoc at uh, La Monde and then became a faculty member at Brown University. Colleen's study uh, mostly focused on using surface waves to study the Earth's deep structure, which uh, spans both continents and oceans. And today she is going to tell us um, what she has been doing for years about the um, the, 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 the thinosphere, lithosphere boundary um, in the oceanic, the upper mantle. With that, I will give it all to Colleen. Great. Yeah, thanks for the introduction and thanks for inviting me to give this virtual seminar. Today I'm going to show results that bear on the rheology of the oceanic upper mantle. And much of this work was done together with um, G2 Ma, who many of you know, got his PhD from Scripps in 2015, then did a postdoc at Brown in my group, and now is at Tongji University in China. And along the way, I'll show some new results about the nature of overtone interference on Rayleigh waves, and that's been led by Anand Taraharan, who's a third year PhD student in my group. And more generally, the attenuation work, attenuation work has benefited greatly from interactions with Josh Russell, who's now at Brown, Jim Garrity, and then my colleagues, Greg Hirth and Don Forsyth. And um, I don't know how you guys usually do these things, but please feel free to interrupt me. I probably won't be able to monitor the chat while I'm talking, but I'll try to pause sometimes and take a breath so that you can speak up if you have a question or a comment. So I'd like to start by looking at some olivine micro creep data. As I'm sure you know, laboratory experiments have yielded many valuable insights about how rocks respond to an applied stress. And these micro creep data show the strain response of olivine at high temperature to a step function in stress applied from zero to 2000 seconds. There's three primary regimes in the response. First, there's an instantaneous elastic strain. Then there's a transient response in which the strain rate is evolving toward the third regime, which is the steady state viscous response. When the stress is removed, the elastic strain is recovered instantaneously and completely. The transient strain is gradually and almost completely recovered. And then the viscous strain is permanent. So the transient regime is my focus of interest today. Seismic attenuation, the loss of energy of seismic waves, occurs as a consequence of transient creep. Uh, and so do numerous other processes that are at even longer timescales and can also be observed at Earth's surface, including post-seismic relaxation following earthquakes, surface response to hydrologic loading and unloading, and the rebound that occurs after lake drainage and ice melting events. Transient rheology is central to being able to understand and model all of these phenomena. The top figure here shows frequency spectra of attenuation. Attenuation corresponds to the inverse of the quality factor Q. So you'll see this capital Q on a lot of my slides. And the attenuation spectrum is considered to be a superposition of two contributions. There's the high temperature background where attenuation is weakly dependent on frequency. And then there's an absorption peak, which is often attributed to elastically accommodated grain boundary sliding. The figure on the right here illustrates the processes of um, grain boundary sliding. The top panel shows the geometry of the two grains as well as the boundary between them. And the stress from a passing seismic wave facilitates sliding along the grain boundary. Initially, this sliding is accommodated elastically, resulting in stress concentrations at the grain corners. That's what's shown in the middle panel. This is elastically accommodated grain boundary sliding. And when the stress is removed, for example, when the seismic wave has passed, the stress concentrations act as a restoring force that allow the deformation to be recovered. If the stress is instead applied for longer, then diffusion of matter along the grain boundaries 
facilitates the evolution of the stress state towards that required for steady state creep. That's what's shown in the bottom panel. This process is re referred to as diffusionally accommodated gray boundary sliding. It's also represented by the high temperature background on the left. And when the stress is removed, this stress configuration is relieved by diffusion, allowing for gradual recovery. So the other point I want to make on this slide is that analasticity, these processes, they reduce the shear modulus and therefore the shear velocity relative to the purely elastic case. That's what's shown in the bottom panel on the left. And again, the shape of the attenuation spectrum is important. Whereas the high temperature background produces a mild modulus reduction that's distributed broadly in frequency, the presence of the absorption peak is associated with a large modulus reduction that's centered at the frequency of the peak. So it's worth emphasizing that the modulus remains low or relaxed at frequencies lower than the peak and high or unrelaxed at higher frequencies. So the point here is that the position of this absorption peak can have a critical effect on velocity in the seismic band, what we measure. And I'm going to illustrate that on the right here. In this example, on the top, all three attenuation spectra have the same high temperature background, but different characteristics of the peak. In black, there's no peak. In green, the peak is centered at 1 hertz. And in blue, the peak is centered at 177 hertz. In the bottom, you can see the consequences for the velocity reduction. The absence of the peak in black means only a very mild reduction in velocity, whereas the presence of the peak in green and blue mean larger reductions. And you can see that the frequency of the peak governs the shape of the velocity spectra. So the thing that's important to note here is that the magnitude of these velocity reductions that we're talking about, 1% in black to 3 to 4% in green and blue, are on the scale of the velocity perturbations that we are typically trying to interpret in tomographic models. So understanding how analasticity affects velocity is actually crucial for our interpretations. Now, laboratory experiments have been providing essential information about analasticity. And this is, um, there are two main labs that do this work. Here you're seeing examples from um, Uli Fall and Ian Jackson. These are their data on melt-free olivine. And what you can see is that higher attenuation is found for hotter conditions, for longer periods and for smaller grain sizes. The shear modulus reduction in the top is also largest under these conditions. But it's not just the magnitude of attenuation that's affected, it's also the nature of the frequency dependence. These melt-free data from Fall and Jackson hint at an attenuation peak or plateau at short periods that's most prominent at low temperatures. Now, the presence of partial melt along with the olivine enhances attenuation above the melt-free case, but it also changes the nature of the frequency dependence, introducing a peak or plateau at, at intermediate periods. And then in Yasuko Takei's lab, they do attenuation experiments on Borneo, which they consider an analog for olivine. So here, warmer colors represent warmer temperatures, and the x-axis is increasing frequency instead of increasing period. The Borneo data also suggest a peak, a plateau, and attenuation that grows stronger and broader as the melting temperature is approached and then exceeded. So all of these laboratory measurements suggest that constraints on the frequency dependence of attenuation in the Earth's mantle would be very useful. And in a 2017 paper, Takeuchi and co-authors published a nice study of attenuation of high frequency P and S waves that were generated by aftershocks of the 2011 Tohoku earthquake and measured by ocean bottom seismometers on old Pacific seafloor. Their measurements were largely centered at uh, three hertz and they found that three hertz, which I'll call high frequency attenuation, was 50 times higher in the asthenosphere than in the lithosphere. And when they combine these values with earlier low frequency constraints on attenuation, the results suggested that attenuation was largely independent of frequency in the asthenosphere but much more strongly dependent of, on frequency in the lithosphere. And so the author speculated about whether this was, for example, evidence of melt in the asthenosphere. I haven't said anything about how the water affects attenuation, and that's largely because there are very few laboratory measurements, and I would say the jury is still out. Klein had a paper in Nature in 2018 where they showed that water has a negligible effect on attenuation, which it's not easy to see that from the way this figure is 
but you can trust me that that's the conclusion of that paper. Um, however, others have pointed out that this is sort of a surprising and unexpected result since steady state diffusion creep is enhanced by the presence of water. So why wouldn't transient diffusion creep also be? And uh, separately, Shun Corrado has, in a series of papers, argued that water should change the frequency of that absorption peak and move it to higher frequencies and therefore move the modulus reduction associated with it to higher frequencies as well. So to summarize my introduction then, we're interested in seismic attenuation because it places constraints on the thermodynamic state of the mantle, the temperature, the melt content, the volatile content. Um, but it can also help us understand the microphysical processes, that is the processes at the grain scale that are responsible for attenuation. And then finally, both seismic attenuation and velocity are affected by these microphysical processes. So under the right circumstances, it should be possible to use both of them. We have recently completed a study of seismic attenuation in the middle of the Pacific plate using waveforms recorded by the no melt array of ocean bottom seismometers, which was deployed throughout 2012 on 70 million year old seafloor. The no melt array was designed to study the lithosphere and the asthenosphere in no more normal oceanic upper mantle. Um, so for example, there's no surface volcanism or anomalous seafloor in this area. We measured the travel times and amplitudes of Rayleigh waves for 125 earthquakes at 15 of the no melt stations. And you can see from this map that the position of the array in the middle of the Pacific plate allows excellent azimuthal coverage. So this is a fairly unique data set for at least two reasons. One, we're able to determine a regional scale attenuation model. The diameter of no melt is about 500 kilometers. So that gives us pretty high spatial resolution. Um, but the second is that it is to our knowledge, the first regional scale attenuation model in the middle of a oceanic plate thereby representing the most common tectonic setting on Earth. This figure shows other regional scale Rayleigh wave attenuation studies that I'm aware of, and I may have missed one or two, but uh, doesn't really change the point, which is there's really only a handful of such studies. And the reason that there are so few is because attenuation is measured from the seismic wave amplitude, and they are difficult to interpret. These maps show some of our Rayleigh wave measurements at a period of 80 seconds from three different earthquakes at the no melt array. Um, the direction of wave propagation is shown by the arrows and the travel times are in the top. And you can see that the travel times are pretty straightforward. The Rayleigh waves enter the array with a smaller travel time and then it increases at a fairly steady rate as they pass through it. In the bottom are the Rayleigh wave amplitudes and they are more complex. If attenuation was the only thing happening to them, you'd expect them to enter the array with a high amplitude and then it would fall off at a pretty steady rate. Um, but none of these examples show exactly that happening. An even more striking example of the complexity of amplitudes can be seen at seismic stations in the US. These are 50 second Rayleigh wave measurements made at US array stations. In the top from three co-located events at southwest and in the bottom from three co-located events occurring to the west. And as on the previous slide, the travel times show a nice steady increase um, as we expect and the amplitudes show more complexity. For example, the amplitudes develop bands of high and low values as the waves propagate across the western US. And this is because the amplitudes are affected, affected by factors other than just attenuation. We consider an amplitude measurement to depend on four contributions. There's an amplitude at the earthquake source, an amplitude at the due to the receiver, that's both the station, the site, and the instrument. There are propagation effects like focusing and defocusing. And then finally, there's the decay due to attenuation. So if we want to isolate the signal due to attenuation, we have to somehow account for all the other factors. And that's the challenge. In this study, we handle that challenge by approximating the wave field as two interfering plane waves. We follow closely the approach developed by Don Forsyth and I Bing Lee. Um, for every earthquake, we solve for six parameters, the three, three for each plane wave, the amplitude initial phase and arrival angle of the two plane waves. And then all of the data contribute to regional parameters, including the 2D phase velocity map, 
1 d as mean cell anisotropy, and then an average amplitude decay that represents the attenuation. The figure shows the amplitude decay as a function of frequency in the top and the average phase velocity in the bottom. Um, the error bars are the measurements that we made, and then the red circles show the results obtained with different parameters for smoothing and damping and the size of the area considered in the inversion. So in almost all cases, the red circles um, fall within the error bars. In other words, the effect of these choices are smaller than the formal error that's estimated from the inversion scheme. So we expect that our measurements are robust. What we next do is to solve for depth dependent shear velocity and attenuation. But actually first, I'm going to take a detour um, because focusing effects may be the biggest challenge for measuring attenuation, but they're not the only one. And we discovered this when we started making measurements of Rayleigh wave amplitudes on synthetic waveforms that were calculated by the spectral element code SpecFem 3D globe for a 3D seismic model. A big advantage of these synthetic measurements is that we can cover a larger swath of the earth with stations at the same time, um, like for example, the entire US than is possible with more limited dimensions of an actual deployment like US array. So these figures show 100 second Rayleigh wave amplitudes that were generated by an event at 42 kilometers depth in the northern Molucca Sea. As with the earlier examples I showed, there's complexity. Um, but what was unexpected was the alternating bands of low and high amplitudes. They're perpendicular to the general direction of wave propagation and roughly parallel to the wave fronts. And the phenomenon is not specific to a particular measurement approach. The measurements on the left were made with interspacing cross-correlation of Gin and Garrity, and the measurements on the right were determined with the phase match filtering approach of Euron Ekstrom. The banding can be seen not only in the amplitudes, but also in the Rayleigh wave delay times, especially when they're plotted as residuals relative to the predictions of a 1D model like PREM. So here the bands show up as advances and delays of five to 10 seconds. Five to 10 seconds is not a huge error for a total time delay integrated along a long propagation path. So it's unlikely to have a large effect on global phase velocity maps, for example. But it can be a much larger effect for phase velocities that are estimated using nearby stations, for example, the two station approach or an array based method like wavefront tracking. Um, and so this can be seen when the Iconal equation is applied to Rayleigh wave phase delays from a single event and then used to solve for regional scale phase velocity maps, like you can see here. The input structure that would ideally be recovered is shown in the bottom, slow velocities in the Western US, high velocities in the, associated with the craton in the North Central um, US. But the recovered models are shown in the top. Again, this is for a single event. And in this case, the bias introduced by the banding is so strong, so severe that it largely overprints the actual structure. Here's a second example from a different event. In this case, the travel times on the left were measured with interstation cross-correlation, and on the right were measured with the cluster analysis approach that G2Ma developed as part of his PhD at Scripps. In this case, the banding is less severe, in, um, and so the input structure is better recovered with the exception of the easternmost um, US at epicentral distances beyond 128 degrees or so. And the bottom panel shows a transect along a ray path which makes it possible to estimate the wavelength of the oscillations, which is about three to five degrees, depending on location. So we now understand that the origin of the banding is interference of higher mode or overtone Rayleigh waves along the major arc with the fundamental mode Rayleigh wave that we're trying to measure along the minor arc. Um, this is a nice record section from one of Gabby's papers. And the fundamental mode Rayleigh waves are the dominant signal, you can see R1 on the major arc, R2 on the, or R1 on the minor arc, R2 on the major arc, R3, R4, and so on. And then the overtone wave trains are shown by gray lines and labeled with Xs, X1, X2, X3. Um, so since the overtones generally travel at a faster group speed, they tend to arrive earlier than the fundamental mode. And thus at distances beyond 120 degrees or so, the X2 wave trains can arrive in the same time window as the R1 wave trains that we're actually trying to isolate and measure. So we tested this idea with synthetic seismograms calculated with normal mode summation um, for a known 1D Earth model. 
the advantage of using normal mode summation is that we can control which mode branches are included in the seismogram. So we calculated two sets of seismograms, one that can set that contains only the fundamental mode and one that contains all the mode branches. And we measure amplitudes and phase delays for Rayleigh waves on both sets. And you can see the phase velocity maps that we solve for um, here. So of course, the input structure is homogeneous because it's a 1D Earth model. And when we take the measurements from synthetics in which only the fundamental mode was present, we largely recover that input model quite well. However, when we make measurements on the synthetics that contain all the modes, we get this um, the strong wavefront parallel bands of high and low velocities, just like on the previous slides. In other words, though, the interference of the major arc overtones with the minor arc fundamental mode can produce and probably do produce the observed banding. The final point I'll make about this interference is that it is present in real data. So here I'm showing Rayleigh wave phase velocities in the top and amplitudes in the middle from, uh, measured at US array stations from two events that occurred in 2012. You can see that the orientation of the bands and the wavelength of the bands are very similar to what I showed you from synthetic data on the previous slides. Now, of course, these are just single events and structural phase velocity maps are determined from many events. And one way that that can be done is to average numerous event specific phase velocity maps to create a composite phase velocity map. And so on this slide, I'm showing how the high remote interference can impact these composite maps. The map in the top left is determined from all, it's about 570 events in our US array data set. The map in the bottom left is determined only from events closer than 115 degrees. So that's in the range where we don't expect high remote interference to be a major factor. And then in the bottom right from events beyond 115 degrees where we expect the interference bias should be larger. So you can see that the map determined from data, oh, and I should say that the same number of events went into the measurements in both maps in the bottom panel. Um, so you can see that the map determined from more distant events is much noisier and has relatively poor agreement with the map determined from all events. On the other hand, the good news is that the map determined from all events does not seem um, measurably biased by the inclusion of some data that are prone to major arc overtone interference, probably because the bulk of the data set is from closer distances. So we've done a bunch of additional work on this topic, but in the interest of time, I'm going to pivot back to talking about attenuation and velocity at the no melt array in the middle of the Pacific. And I was not able to find a more graceful transition, so I'm just going to remind you where we left off, which was looking at average amplitude decay and average phase velocity across the no melt array as a function of frequency. What we're going to do is use the fact that Rayleigh waves at different frequencies sample the Earth or seismic structure at different depths to solve for depth dependent attenuation and velocity models. On the left here, you can see the sensitivity of Rayleigh wave attenuation at five periods, the shear attenuation at depth. So first, the attenuation inversion, we perform two inversions for depth dependent attenuation. And the first, we allow just two layers of attenuation. And so we do a parameter search. We search over a large range of attenuation values in a shallow layer, in a deep layer, and then we also search over the depth of the boundary between those two layers. And the panel on the left shows the acceptable models with 90% confidence. Uh, attenuation is much lower in the shallow layer than in the deep layer. And the boundary is somewhere between 60 and 80 kilometers with 70 kilometers being the best fit. In the second case, we allow attenuation to vary more generally with depth. And so the fully depth dependent model is shown in green. Um, it permits a bit more complexity. So the transition is still around 70 kilometers, but attenuation at shallower depths is extremely low, almost negligible. Attenuation at around 100 kilometers is slightly higher than in the two layer model and at greater depths slightly lower than in the two layer model. So with these results in hand, I'd like to then briefly revisit the issue of frequency dependence. This figure shows the three hertz attenuation measurements from Takeuchi in the Western Pacific in the lithosphere and the asthenosphere. And they're being compared to some earlier low frequency constraints 
um, from low frequency surface waves or even normal modes in a couple of these cases. And as I mentioned earlier, Takeuchi noted uh, little frequency dependence in the asthenosphere, but a strong frequency dependence in the lithosphere. And then I've put our, no, our new no melt constraints on here with the triangles. And you can see our results at no melt largely confirm the interpretation for the asthenosphere of no or weak frequency dependence, but they significantly revise the interpretation for the lithosphere. And in fact, we find very low attenuation in the lithosphere at no melt requires little to no frequency dependence in the lithosphere. So presumably the fact that our new model is a regional scale model, whereas some of these others, PREM, QL6, and QRFSI12, our global scale models, allows us to have better resolution of the shallow layer. But we don't see a need to appeal to different frequency dependencies in these two layers. Now, I'd like to discuss seismic velocity at no melt. And Josh Russell is responsible for the velocity model. It's determined from inverting three different data sets together, the phase velocities of fundamental mode Rayleigh waves in a broad period range, and then of fundamental mode love waves and first overtone Rayleigh waves at short periods. And Hannah Mark, who was a grad student at Hui, processed SP receiver functions at the NOML stations and found evidence for a sharp velocity gradient around 65 kilometers depth. So we've therefore made two different versions of the velocity model. One um, that contains a 5% velocity reduction from 60 to 65 kilometers, which we call a discontinuous model, and one that does not, which we call the smooth model. You can see on the right that the two models make nearly identical predictions of phase velocities, and they fit all data sets equally well. Um, and the models are radial anisotropic. So Rayleigh waves constrain vertically polarized shear wave speed to depths of about 300 kilometers or so. And then the love waves constrain horizontally polarized shear wave speed to 30 kilometers. And then we make assumptions about the SH at greater depths. Overall, the new models have the expected shape, decreasing velocity with depth, a distinct minimum that occurs at about 130 kilometers for the smooth model and a little bit deeper for the discontinuous model. So what we do next then is try to separate the elastic and anelastic contributions to shear velocity. And here's how we do that. We consider a range of realistic geotherms for 70 million year old seafloor, including half space cooling and plate cooling models that merge with adiabats with potential temperatures of 1350 and 1450 degrees C. On later slides, I'm gonna to refer to the coldest and hottest of these geotherms as the cold and hot end members. And then we use the perplex software to predict profiles of isotropic velocity with depth for all geotherms and for Harzbergite and pyrolite compositions. And that's what's shown in the middle panel. As expected, they have decreasing velocity within the thermal boundary layer, a well-defined minimum at the base of the conductive layer, and then slightly increasing velocity along the adiabat. The colder geotherms yield faster velocity than the hotter geotherms, so does the more depleted composition. But the key factor here is that these perplex predictions are purely elastic velocities. Now the red and blue curves are the isotropic no melt velocities. At 60 kilometers and deeper, the no melt velocities are slower than the perplex predictions. And we consider this to be a consequence of anelasticity. And in the right hand panel, we use the ratio of the no melt velocities to the elastic velocities to estimate the size of the velocity reduction. Depending on which anharmonic profile we use, that reduction can be as large as four to 6%. And we attribute that to anelasticity. So I wanna take a minute here to emphasize that a big advantage of doing this study at no melt is that the thermal and chemical properties of the oceanic governmental are fairly well known. And as a result, it is actually possible to try to do what I'm doing here, which is to remove, predict, and then account for the truly elastic contribution to velocity so that the anelastic contribution can be isolated. And it's very useful because it provides a second observable in addition to attenuation that's sensitive to anelasticity. And so what we do finally then is to compare our two anelastic observables, attenuation and then the anelastic part of shear velocity to predictions from Jackson and Falls lab-based parameterization. The green and black show predictions done with the cold and hot 
n members for a grain size of 10 millimeters. And you can see that the predictions match the observed attenuation fairly well at depths greater than 80 kilometers or so. Um, and that the predictions match the velocity contribution fairly well at all depths, although perhaps the predictions are a bit fast, deeper than 120 kilometers. The main discrepancy is in the attenuation model at depths shallower than 70 kilometers. The predictions have much higher attenuation than the model. So we investigate the relative roles of the high temperature background versus the absorption peak. The dotted lines that I've just added to the slide are the prediction of Jackson and Falls model for just the high temperature background. We've excluded the effects of the peak. And so you can see that in terms of attenuation, this new prediction does a much better job matching the observations at shallow depths without really compromising the fit at greater depths. On the other hand, it greatly worsens the fit to shear velocity and it makes the predictions are too fast at almost all depths. So to help us better understand this, we can look at the attenuation and velocity spectra. And first, let's look at a depth of 50 kilometers. At this temperature and Jackson and Falls parameterization, the absorption peak overlaps with the seismic band. And that explains why the predicted attenuation profiles have high attenuation at 60 kilometers and 50 kilometers, despite the cold temperatures. Without the peak, in other words, in the dotted lines here, attenuation is very low because the high temperature background is sensitive to temperatures and the temperatures are pretty cold. In the bottom panel, you can see the velocity spectra and they depend only slightly on whether or not the peak is present. Now let's look at 140 kilometers depth. At this depth in Jackson and Falls parameterization, the absorption peak is located outside of the seismic band. So it's focused really at higher frequencies. So it doesn't impact the attenuation prediction in the seismic band. But for the velocity, the seismic band is sampling the relaxed velocity, which is reduced by four or 5% because of the presence of the absorption peak. When the peak is removed and we look only at the high temperature background, again, that's what's shown by the dotted lines here, the attenuation prediction is barely affected in the seismic band, but the velocity prediction is greatly affected because high temperature background predicts a much weaker velocity reduction in the absence of the absorption peak. So what this comparison suggests is that at depths shallower than 70 kilometers, the observations are best fit by the high temperature background only. Whereas at greater depths, the high temperature background and the absorption peak are needed to satisfy the low velocities. Jackson and Fall in their experiments have been very upfront about the fact that they have a hard time locating the peak and frequency. It's clear that their data require the presence of the peak, but there's a lot of uncertainty as to which frequency the peak should actually be at. Um, so what we're going to do next then is use the no melt observations to search for the peak frequency at each depth that can match the no melt attenuation and shear velocity simultaneously. The way that we do that is to construct 125 different attenuation and velocity spectra in each depth. They all have the same high temperature background parameters, but the position of the absorption peak varies over a broad range of frequencies. These panels show examples of these attenuation and velocity spectra for a depth of 50 kilometers on the left and 140 kilometers on the right. Um, you can see that they make different predictions of attenuation and velocity in the seismic band and only some of them are actually gonna fit the no melt values, which are shown in yellow. In 50, at 50 kilometers depth, the spectra that will fit the no melt values have to have extremely low attenuation and also fairly high velocity. At 140 kilometers depth, the spectra that can fit the observations have to have moderate attenuation and low velocity. So at every depth, we go through this exercise of identifying which subset of the spectra actually fit both sets of observations simultaneously. And the results of that search are summarized by the blue bars here. They show that the frequency of the absorption peak 
very strongly with depth. It's very low at shallow depths, 40, 50, 60 kilometers, and it's several orders of magnitude higher at greater depths. And there's a fairly sharp transition between 60 and 80 kilometers. We obtain the same result, whether we use the smooth or the discontinuous velocity model. The red curve here shows the frequency of the Rayleigh wave that's most sensitive to each depth. And so the position of this red curve relative to our results explains the velocity changes with depth. At shallow depths, the Rayleigh waves are sampling, um, or the Rayleigh waves have a higher frequency than the absorption peak. And so the Rayleigh waves are sampling the fast unrelaxed velocity. And at greater depths, the Rayleigh waves have a lower frequency than the absorption peak. And so they're sampling the relaxed, slower velocities. OK, so what can we learn about the Earth from this exercise? If we assume that the absorption peak is due to elastically accommodated grain boundary sliding, then the frequency of the peak depends on four different factors. The unrelaxed shear modulus, the grain size, and then the properties of the grain boundary, its thickness and its viscosity. We're estimating here that the frequency of the absorption peak varies by several orders of magnitude over about 20 kilometers in depth. So there's no reason to think that shear modulus or grain size should change by several orders over that depth range. Instead, the properties of the grain boundary must change and the grain boundary viscosity is an obvious candidate. So on the right here, I've illustrated what the depth dependence of the peak frequency might mean for the depth dependence of the grain boundary viscosity. Relatively high at shallower depths and a fairly sharp transition to lower grain boundary viscosities at greater depths. Shun Corrado has proposed that changing the water content of the mantle can change the grain boundary viscosity, specifically lower viscosity for higher water contents. So it seems possible that what we're seeing here is a change in water content with depth. A dry lithosphere, presumably dehydrated due to melting at the ridge, underlain by a damp athenosphere. And indeed, a change in water content is also consistent with electrical conductivity measurements from the no melt study region, which, as you can see here, are much less conductive at depths shallower than 70 or 80 kilometers and much more conductive at greater depths. Emily Sarifian and co-authors who did this study inferred about 150 ppm water at 150 kilometers depth and negligible water at depths shallower than 90 kilometers. So to conclude, we've developed new high resolution models of shear attenuation and velocity in the central Pacific, which in a region that should be considered typical of normal oceanic upper mantle. We obtained two observables that are both sensitive to analasticity, attenuation of course, but also we identified or tried to isolate the analastic contribution to shear velocity. And we used those two observables to determine the best rating frequencies of an absorption peak that is likely, the, the origin of which is likely grain boundary sliding that, sliding that is elastically accommodated. This is an advantage because it comes overcomes laboratory challenges of imaging this peak, which previous studies have had difficulty doing. And we find a large change in the properties of the absorption peak between 60 and 80 kilometers, which we speculate might correspond to the base of a dehydrated lid. I also spend a little bit of time showing new results on how higher mode Rayleigh waves interfere with the fundamental mode that we're trying to measure. The biggest impact is on regional attenuation measurements, especially interstation measurements over short distances. But for sure, this, this phenomenon will be a source of noise and bias in regional array-based phase velocity maps if it's not accounted for. Thanks very much again for the time, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Great. Thank you so much, Colleen, for a wonderful talk. And now it's time for questions, questions from the audience. You can either simply speak up or raise your hand in the chat, but uh, make sure you unmute yourself before you uh, speak up so that I can uh, hear you. Okay, I think uh, Casey has a question. Casey? 
Oh, sorry. Um, oh, oh, I see. This is the other constable. Um, lovely talk. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I was wondering if um, a small amount of partial melt could explain the results instead of an increasing water content. Yeah, so right, that's, that's a good question. We can't rule out that there's a small amount of partial melt, but there's, if there is, there's not much. And the reason for that is, uh, first of all, the attenuation that we measure is quite moderate. So Q of about 100 is, is not as high, or not as high attenuation as we measure, for example, at the East Pacific Rise or the Juan de Fuca Ridge. So it's it's a rel relatively moderate attenuation so that argues against there being a significant amount of partial melt there. And similarly, the electrical conductivity cannot support a significant amount of partial melt either. So we can't rule out that there's a little bit of partial melt there, but it's very small if it is present. Okay, thank you. Uh, I think Peter has a question. Peter? Um, yes, Colleen, uh, have a great talk. I'm um, curious about um, the higher modes uh, and um, the interference. Um, is that something that um, will always just be a source of um, noise or is there a way that uh, one could either um, model them or um, subtract out um, um, the interference. I mean, is it predictable enough that it um, could be removed? Yeah, thanks, Peter, for the question. So Anant has a follow-up paper to that original paper where he has done a lot of testing to explore the characteristics of this interference in more detail. So our initial paper really just focused on a single period, for example. And we, the, the first paper was really focused on documenting this phenomenon and in data and in synthetic seismograms. So what he has found in the follow-up paper is that the degree to which the overtones are excited by the source um, can be linked very clearly to how strongly the interference shows up in the in the data. So for the right source geometry and depth, it is possible that the overtones are, um, there are scenarios in which the overtones are not well excited. And so the interference effects are relatively minimized. The other thing is the interesting thing about the Rayleigh wave interference is because it's the minor arc and the major arc interfering with each other, they kind of pass through each other fairly quickly. So there are distance ranges where we could predict by knowing the group speeds of the fundamental mode and the overtones, what distance ranges that interference is going to be largest and make a recommendation that you don't use data from that particular distance range. Um, and then there might be other distance ranges where it's, it's safer. So in the first paper, we just said, Anything beyond 120 degrees seems problematic. But now we have more details about how variable that interference is. And so we can make more specific recommendations. The, certain parts of the globe are going to be more impacted by the interference than others. So for example, the South Atlantic, a large fraction of the events that are recorded by stations in the South Atlantic are at distances greater than 120 degrees. So that data set will be more strongly biased by this effect than, for example, the Western US, it's actually not as bad as it is even in the Eastern US. So there's a little bit that can be done by data selection. I don't know at this point that we could we could recommend a way to, re a better way to remove it. Of course, there is an opportunity there to maybe be able to measure those overtones and do something with that as well. Okay, thank you. Uh, Wen Yuan, Wen Yuan has a question. Yes, great talk, Colin. I really enjoyed that. I also have a question about the overtone interference, which is kind of fascinating. It's, do you have comments about what such interference would lead to the mirrored propagation direction or how that changes uh, arrival angle measurements? 
Or are you asking? So you're, you're asking, I commented on how the interference would affect phase velocity and amplitude, and you're asking, do we have we looked at how it would affect arrival angle? Is, is that the yes. question? Yes. We haven't tried to quantify that. No, I, we haven't done anything to look at what the magnitude or the pattern is um, <clears throat> for arrival angle. We could. That's a good. It's a really good question. Um, I, I would be very curious to see that. It's just at least from what I have been trying to locate that with the angle, and it, there is always a very large angle misfit from the gray circle path, no matter where the events are from. Um, I would love to see how that actually plays into the role. Yeah, great. If, yeah, if you want to send me an email or, or a not also, yes. he, he would be thrilled to know people are sort of interested in how this might affect their own research. Great. I would definitely follow up with you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Gabi? Yeah, I join everybody else saying this is this was a great talk. Thanks. Um, and it's probably me not paying enough attention. But my question is, when you talked about the experiments with a SPECFEM synthetics and the US array observations, I mean, how do you distinguish between what's from interference with overtones or what's due to structure outside of the US array? like between a source and your array. I mean, that that changes amplitudes and, and arrival angles a lot. Yeah, um, these, the overtone interference is very much wavefront parallel. So we, you know, we can, it, it's a phenomenon that's changing with epicentral distance in a very straightforward and predictable way. Um, and like, for example, I, maybe I'll just back up a couple of slides. This example here, so the black arrow shows the propagation path and the contours are showing um, epicentral distance. So you can tell that the wave is coming in from from the west and the interference effects are actually pretty mild through the western and central US. And then they don't become profound until they get to 126 or 127 um, degrees. And, and that's when for this particular event, whichever overtones are, are highly excited are, in, are crossing the path of the minor arc wave. So we, it's very much an oscillation as a function of epicentral distance. M my experience looking at um, wave fields that are being influenced by structure outside the study region is that it's actually more likely that the banding is going to develop um, parallel, parallel to the propagation fact. For example, if, we are, if waves are getting focused and defocused as they travel, those stripes of amplitude tend to be oriented in the opposite direction of, of what we're observing here. Okay, uh, actually, another I, stupid oh, question. Go ahead. Sorry. A stupid. So, I think in simple terms, I mean, ha, ha, I'm sure you did try doing that with 1D synthetics and just to single out the interference effects. Yeah, exactly. That was sort of a smoking gun that oh, okay. helped us actually understand what this was, because for a while we just thought maybe we had implemented spec fem wrong, or maybe the measurement approach was kind of a little off. But when we started doing experiments with normal mode synthetics um, and controlling which branches we put in to allow to be in the synthetics, then we were able to reproduce it. If we have only the fundamental mode in the synthetics, we don't get this pattern. And if we do have other modes, then we get this oscillating pattern. But we were surprised that it hadn't been um, better documented yet, because I think there was a, a pretty good understanding, as in your 2015 paper that I'm showing here, that these overtone wave mm. fields were intersecting the fundamental mode. It's just that actually the magnitude of the effect is not enormous. Like I said, it's just a few 
second. So it's not going to have a big impact on long propagation paths. But once you start to differentiate them to do regional scale studies, then that those differences can actually really blow up. I mean, I'd love to discuss this some more, but I mean, it, it seems that in your spectrum synthetics, the transition between nothing serious and a banding is much more abrupt than with a 1D synthetics. So uh, anyway, I, I didn't mean to. Great talk. Great <laughs> talk. All right, thank you. Uh, actually, I have a question as well. So I'm a little bit confused about how uh, you use surface waves to measure uh, attenuation because we all know that certain different periods, uh, surface waves with different periods uh, have different sensitivity to different depths. But uh, you said that uh, attenuation is also a function of frequency. So does that mean you can only measure the attenuation of a specific frequency band for a specific depth? Yeah, that's a really good question. And that's something we had to think really carefully about for the interpretation part of that study. And it's also an issue for the velocity model because typically, as you probably know, velocity models are defined at a reference frequency. So PREM, the reference frequency is one Hertz. And even though PREM is largely developed from long period surface wave and normal mode data, all of them were adjusted to a frequency of one hertz by making an assumption about how anelasticity affects velocity. And so a lot of models actually have those assumptions, um, assumption of an absorption band, typically a frequency independent attenuation is embedded in almost all velocity models. So when we solved for the velocity models at no melt, we, we did not do that and instead in these velocity models that you're looking at right here, the relevant frequency is the frequency of whatever Rayleigh wave is most sensitive to that depth. So there's actually, um, right, the velocity at 125 kilometers is being informed by whatever Rayleigh wave period is most sensitive to 125 kilometers. We didn't try to standardize everything to a, cer a certain frequency. Um, and that's why even when we looked, when I showed you these, um, sorry to hop around here, but if you look at these no melt green boxes on the right here, you can see at 50 kilometers, they're centered at a certain frequency range, um, a little bit higher than uh, 100 seconds, a shorter period than 100 seconds. And then if I go to 140 kilometers, they're at a different um, frequency range. So we've allowed that the frequency that's relevant to every measurement is actually depth dependent. Um, and the same thing for the attenuation model. So the predictions of attenuation that you're seeing here use a different frequency at every depth. I see. Great, thanks. All right, more questions? Okay, if there is no more questions, we we'll want to thank uh, Colin again for her wonderful talk and all the stimulating discussions following it. Thank you everyone for participating in this seminar. And next week, I think, uh, yeah, actually I can't remember <laughs> who, who will talk at the next week's seminar, but uh, we'll see. Thank you again, uh, everyone for participating. Oh, Jean-Lu Margot. Yes, yeah, Jean-Lu Margot will be uh, talking next week. He's uh, a planet planetary physicist from UCLA and the seminar will be hosted by uh, Catherine Guns. Okay, great. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thanks very much. Week. See you all. <laughs>